Happy Friday, everyone. Again, hope you're safe, hope you're doing well. Today's the last little part of a three-part segment I've been talking about during the end days of your pet, a time in which we will typically all meet if we own enough pets in our lifetime. Very difficult decisions have to be made and very difficult emotions and, and trauma. It's it just all part of it. It just really is. But I, I have found personally, the more prepared I was for the situation, the better I just got through it. Just kind of like a, you know what's coming, you deal with it, you move on. Absorb, move, hunt, knee, like we used to say in Alaska. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit today. So we already talked about how do you recognize that it is the end days for your pet. And then after that, what happens if you get the notification that your suspicions are real? Do you do a pet hospice? Do you euthanize the animal? What do you do? We covered that. Today I want to talk about it's over. Your pet has died. And then I want to talk about a circumstances that can occur before your pet dies. It's about you dying first. But let's get back to now your pet has passed away from you. Sad day, but what do we do next? What do we do with this body? And this needs to be thought out because of a couple of reasons. One, a lot of people love to bury their pet in their yard or on their property. But did you know that the laws vary in every single state as to what's allowed to be done and what's not? Now, what I've done is I picked through a bunch of them and came up with a consensus of really consistent laws requiring what you must obey if you decide to bury your pet in your yard. And here we go. First of all, the grave must be three feet deep. And any mound of dirt or rock that is over it must be two feet high. It has to be a minimum of 300 feet away from your nearest neighbor. It has to be 100 feet away from your property line. 300 feet away from the nearest water. And you must bury your pet within 72 hours of its death. So those are just legal ramifications that you can suffer if you do not obey these minimum distances as required by most states. Uh, there's another consequence, and this one could be absolutely fatal to any other pets that you have or any other neighboring pets or any wildlife at all. And that's the fact that if you had your dog euthanized, then one of the chemicals that is used for that deep anesthetic type approach is pentobarbital. Pentobarbital persists in the, your dog's body for up to a year, uh, if not longer. And I'm telling you, when I owned the vet hospital, we actually had dogs that came in that died. Uh, a family dog was euthanized at our facility. Then they did bury it in their yard, unbeknownst to us, and the other family pet dug the animal up in less than a week, consumed some of it, and when it did, it died from a pentobarbital. So be careful with that. Wildlife can dig up your animals, can dig up a hamster. If you have a hamster you buried, you had the hamster euthanized, you name it. It doesn't take a, a lot of this drug to kill your dog. So keep that in mind as well. If you have your dog euthanized, then it's probably not a good idea that you bury it in your yard unless you bury it in a container that will keep other animals safe from your dog. Because uh, when you do anesthesia, there's some deep drugs that you use to put an animal to sleep, and that can persist in an animal's body for up to a year. Um, I've been there as far as seeing it, uh, the consequences of it. It's really devastating. So really think about that before you bury your dog in your yard if you had it euthanized. So what are some alternatives? Well, there's cremation. And when you do cremation with your pet, you can either choose to have the pet just join a general population. As sad as that sounds and as like impersonal as that sounds, it does happen. Some people simply cannot afford to have a private cremation. So their dog would be cremated with a bunch of other dogs. Um, but if you do, you do have the choice of a private cremation and then you can pick out an urn or a vessel in which you would like to have your dog's remains returned to you. And that's what I personally do. Uh, we have dogs of ours that have passed and we've had them cremated. And recently we had Ollie, our cat, that just passed away a few days ago, cremated. And now Ollie uh, is in a beautiful urn with a beautiful picture adorning the front of it. 
it's just a, I don't know, it's just a tribute to the animal. So think about doing that. It's usually, it's not very expensive and I know expense is relative and it does vary per business, per state, but check it out. It is an option to you. Here's another option that's available to you. You can donate your dog's remains to science. You really can. Veterinary hospitals are, they're begging for it. They want your dog's tissue so they can do an autopsy on your dog and then they can take the samples and they're use it in research that they use to conduct uh, and get a better understanding of diseases and how to treat these diseases in both humans and dogs. So if you want to donate your dog to science, all you need to do is either contact your local veterinary school, so one of the universities that has a school of veterinary medicine, or you can simply contact your veterinarian and ask them for a referral. Uh, but a lot of these uh, institutions definitely want samples to use, and they also can use the body to teach future veterinarians. So think about donating your dog to science um, when it passes. Very noble thing to do, and you'll be helping others and possibly yourself in the long run. All right, so now let's switch over here to you die. Okay, so no one likes to think about that, but let's think about it because you need to. You need to have an exit strategy because when you die, you need to think about this real quickly. Who will take care of your dog? Really think about that because in, in the process of thinking about that, ask these questions. Is that person or group of persons, are they capable? Are those people capable of taking care of your dog? Do they have the money? If you own a dog, you know right now, it costs to own a dog. It costs money. Dog food is not cheap. Veterinary care has definitely gone up in the last few years. Boarding, daycare, training, it's all gone up. So make sure they have the money to take care of your dog. A great heart, unfortunately, just doesn't count. I mean, it, it does count, but what I'm saying, it's not all encompassing. You got to have more than just a good heart. Uh, make sure they have the space for your dog. If your dog's used to running in a wide open space because you own, what, five acres, 10 acres, and suddenly it's going down to a 0.2 lot line, can be very difficult for your dog. Do they have other dogs? How does your dog get a well with other dogs? Take that into consideration. And what about children? What if your dog has a hard time with children? What if it's fearful of children? What if it's attacked children in the past? All of these need to be taken into account. So many times we just think, a family member, they love my dog. Yeah, you're right, they do, because it's your dog. When it becomes their dog, I'm just being blunt here and I'm being honest with you, it's a whole different story. Yeah, I love a lot of other children. But right now, Kira and I are approaching the time period in our life where we're going to be empty nesters. I don't want to start all over again. There's a season for everything. And there's also a season for dog ownership. When you add another dog to someone else's pack, that can be very difficult for them. So what do you do? You talk to your family. If it's your family that you want to take your dog, talk to them. Ask these difficult and painful questions. Ask them, are you prepared? And if they say yes, create a will that says explicitly exactly what will happen in the event of your death. Because I hate to say this, but in the eyes of the law, your dog is mere property. That's all it is. It's property. Your dog could end up in probate. Your dog could end up being sent to a shelter without well, you'll have nothing to say about it because you didn't bother to put it in your will. You didn't bother to talk to your family about it. Yeah, no one expects to die right now. But if it happens, what's going to happen to your dog who has to keep on living? Gives us some thought, guys. Talk to rescues. Put them in your will. If they sign off on it, put it in your will. Leave a letter. Do anything that you can to make sure that your desires are granted after you pass. I cannot tell you how many times in all these years I've been in the pet industry how sad it is. Number one, it's sad when someone dies. When I hear of a client dying, it breaks my heart. But it's even more compounded when I find out 
they have no one to take their dog. So now we even got a, a double problem here. You're sad about the passing of a family, a friend, a loved one, and now you have to deal with the dog. So think about it and be honest with yourself about it. Yes, they need to have a genuinely big heart. But more than anything, they need to be capable. Trust me, the dog will win them over. So if the heart's just a little bitty thing to start with, if they're more than capable of taking care of your dog, that heart will grow. So ask the tough questions and get honest answers because I've seen this more times than I care to see again. Think it through, people. If you think about that with your family, then why wouldn't you think about it with your dog? So get this thing done here, guys. Think about the days in which you're not going to be a part of this world any longer. And think about who's going to survive you, not just your human family members, but your dogs. What's going to happen to them? Have an exit strategy. Okay, guys, so that's it today. All right, we're not going to talk about this anymore. I did have to cover these bases. I hope you picked up some information on it. But we're going to move on from here. A lot more serious things to talk about coming up here in the next couple of videos and definitely next week. i got a big topic for you, a very hot and debatable topic. It's called remote training callers. Do you train with them or do you don't? Why are they called shot callers? Why has this tool been ostracized, been maligned, been sensationalized? Why? Well, let's cut all that out. Let's get down to business. Let's talk facts. That's what I'm going to address to you starting next week. But I got a couple other things coming up this weekend. So if you found this beneficial, especially this part right here, you know, I get all this stuff right here. You know, you don't want to contaminate your well water. You don't want one of your other pets to dig up the remains of your dog. Gosh, that's bad enough as it is. But now the compound with a dog eating pentobarbital and it dies. Oh my gosh. So yeah, pay attention to all this. Take a screenshot of it. Make sure you do it. And then think about alternatives to doing this. Yeah, think about it. You can have it cremated and bury it. Now we're all good to go. We're all kind of safe here. Okay, guys, hope you found this helpful. If you know what to do, if you did, send it to someone who might need this. And if you have any questions you'd like to ask of me, send them my way. Brian with the Y at TamingTheWild.com or drop them in the Facebook feed and I will get to them. Have a great weekend and I'll see you guys tomorrow.